We built this film on a foundation of love. Its purpose? To shatter the mental barriers constructed from a lifetime of indoctrination. The eyes are useless when the mind is blind. We are participants in a prison system we are unable to see. Once the veil is lifted, there is no turning back. Many of us rarely realize we are the victims of indoctrination. We follow the pre-planned layout of life, living in a state of confusion, controlled by a small group of individuals who possess great wealth, estate, and control. They monetarily benefit by keeping us blind to the true nature of the shape of the earth. Most are too busy to question what they are told or investigate the scientific theory about the physical world and its shape, wrongly taught in schools as fact. Inquiries made on a controlled platform such as YouTube or Facebook are quickly rerouted to videos and content that hold no merit. Misconceptions occur either intentionally or due to lack of research by mixing heliocentric and geocentric cosmology together causing incoherence that pushes the viewer away from learning. Why would a lie like this exist? What purpose does this level of deception seek to gain? The hard, solid truth is that all the known space agencies and related industries have made untold amounts of money for many, many years, providing nothing but CGI, fish islands curvature, and Hollywood-style productions as proof. The following evidence should speak for itself through the testimonies of these professionals, pilots, and witnesses. To find yourself, think for yourself. The most courageous act is to think for yourself. Our greatest wish is for minds opened, questions answered, and the reign of freedom through truth revealed. My name is Joshua Silva. I am a licensed commercial pilot and flight instructor. I have had a lifelong love of aviation and aerospace. And when growing up, I even fancied myself an amateur astronomer. Um, I would drag my family and friends, anybody I could to every air show I could possibly find in Northern California. I was the only kid you knew, or anybody knew, that knew the various components on aircraft, spacecraft by heart. Um, I absolutely loved anything to do that, anything to do with flying or space. But my love of aviation and aerospace never stopped. I continued studying, had an entire library full of aviation books of various military and civilian aircraft, military history, every aviation campaign and theater in almost any war. I studied religiously, and it was just out of pure passion. Later in life, many years later, I decided to become a pilot. Um, as strange as it may sound, it hadn't occurred to become a pilot up to that point. I just simply loved aviation and aerospace, but I decided to become a pilot, and I began attending a prestigious flight academy in the Midwest, and attending university at the same time and to gain a degree in aeronautics and aerospace. Shortly thereafter, I began flying twin turboprop aircraft out of Northern California for several nonprofit organizations. And years after that, I found myself flight instructing for various small flight schools, both in California and in Arizona, and then on to large academies that trained for the airlines and even some military flights. Shortly thereafter, I began flying regional business jets, and that's when the story of me finding the topic of Flat Earth started. Hola, mi nombre es Héctor Requena. Soy terraplanista desde el 2016. 
Este tema lo descubrí accidentalmente, me agradó mucho y desde ahí lo empecé a investigar. Desde ahí me di cuenta de lo que está pasando en el mundo. Yo fui aviador, me gusta más la palabra aviador que piloto. Yo volé con mi papá desde niño, él era piloto de la Fuerza Aérea Mexicana. Un tema muy, muy curioso que me pasó a mí fue el, el empezar a conocer cómo funciona el giroscopio. El giroscopio está diseñado para volar sobre un plano, sobre un terreno plano y una tierra que no se mueve. Todos estos temas me llevaron a, a seguir investigando, investigando. Estamos tratando de invitar a la gente a que no se cierre de mente a, a estos temas, ya que si no nos damos cuenta de lo que está pasando ahorita es por lo mismo, porque la gente está cerrada, se cierra a pensar fuera de la caja. Been a military brat all my life. However, I've been in the industry of aviation for the last 21 years. And I became an FE somewhere around 15 or 16 when I really started looking at conspiracies. Uh, I looked into Benghazi because I happened to work on government contracts abroad, overseas. But I've been in aviation for 21 years. Anything from helicopters to aerostats to big birds, little birds, fighter jets. Things with engines, no engines, big blades, little blades, compressor blades, which, by the way, that one's not a hoax. Jets do not run only on compressed air. Contrary to popular belief, it takes compressed air in a blended ratio of air to fuel to drive the now heated gas and rotate the compressor blades. This has been a topic of discussion between FE and, you know, not everything's a hoax. Coriolis effect, with that ties into Obviously, with no spin around the axis points that they say exist at 23.4, conveniently 66 off the, the 90 degrees, right? Everything ties into 666 with NASA and all the BS scientists. Our aircraft have things called ADIs, Attitude Direction Indicator, which gives correlation between the aircraft housing or the shell around the gyro itself. The ADI is nothing more than a gyro that will always reference the level. I don't care what any pilot says. I don't care what any mechanic tells you. You know, there's a reason that pilots have one book called the Pilot Operating Handbook. And there's every other book, right? From structures to avionics to wiring diagrams to the actual components that make up these systems. That is a standalone system. The ADI does not lie. You don't care how cold it is, how high you are. And <laughs> some of these guys are pretty damn high. It doesn't matter where you're going. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter where you are over the realm itself. I woke up to the truth of the flat earth, shape of the earth, as an engineer and a pilot. So I've studied engineering, physics, three different ways, basic physics, electric physics and construction physics and also as a pilot as a rotary wing pilot that is hel helicopter pilot i studied aeronautical physics as well so i can cover and discuss just about any factor of flat earth N not that i'm any smarter than anybody else but i've studied quite a bit of factors that analyze shape and motion of, of just about any object that's physics also aeronautical physics and principles of flight. I can tell you this, airplanes fly straight and level. That's even an aviation term, straight and level. Airplanes will fly for hours at the same altitude, never dipping their nose down to follow the curve of the earth. An aircraft on a 12 hour or even 18 hour flight from Portland, Oregon to Seoul, Korea, that would have that aircraft starting at one point and then flying so far around the earth that it's flying downwards with its nose vertically downwards and then starting to go around around the curve of the earth so that the airplane is now flying upside down would have to make that kind of a flight path on a globe which is it's such an absurdity so that being said i come into the true shape of the earth the flat earth as a skeptic like most anyone else I'll tell you my story. My buddy told me about this. He said, Rob, you need to learn about the ice ring. You need to learn that the earth doesn't move. 
this globe is garbage. And I laughed at him. I said, are you kidding me? I'm not going to, I'm not even going to look into that. He said, that's fine. He said, that's fine. You don't have to look into flat earth. But if, until you do, he said, until you do look into flat earth, you will remain a slave of the matrix. And interestingly enough, at this point, this was more or less November, December 2015. I had already mentally resigned from the U.S. military for three years. I had already resigned because of Benghazi. I realized, and I saw for myself, I'd been working with U.S. as an Army officer, working for State Department for a good 10 years. And so what I did, I turned my physics awareness, I turned my, my studies into analysis of the shape of the Earth. I have a bachelor's degree in English and international business and a master's degree in emergency management. Emergency management is an area of study that deals with lessening the effects of a natural or man-made disaster. Areas I had to study related to emergency management were meteorology, geology, geography, hydrology, and oceanography. You have to know well how Earth works in order to prevent or lessen the consequences of a natural disaster. In 2019, I wrote the book called 16 Emergency Landings Proving Flat Earth. Not many people know that when I was younger, I worked for an international airline. I worked at the International Cargo and Logistics Division of the company at Sao Paulo International Airport. I had to know all international routes in order to provide our clients the precise information about imports and exports as well as the logistics of transporting cargo internationally. Our company transported from a simple parcel package to cars and helicopters to anywhere in the world. Having access to all areas of the airport in 1988, the Brazilian soccer team was about to board their flight towards Australia to take part of the Bicentennial Soccer Cup in Australia. It was a tournament to celebrate Australia's 200th birthday. Two South American teams were invited to take part in this tournament, Brazil and Argentina. At that time, we had access to several maps, all based on the Globe Earth model. The Brazilian squad left to Australia, a natural conclusion is that this charter flight was going to Australia over the Pacific Ocean, as the global model suggests. Perhaps a stop in Santiago, Chile, and then head to Australia. To my surprise, the flight went to Los Angeles. For several days, I could not comprehend the reason why that flight went to Los Angeles in North America to then go towards Australia in the Southern Hemisphere. This thing kept alive in the back of our mind for all these years. I'm a merchant marine. I've been selling 15 years. I graduated from the Paul Hall Maritime Center out of Piney Point, Maryland. I primarily sell on container ships, tankers, drill ships, military cargo vessels, you name it, I can sell on it. I sell in the capacity of Bosun. I hold the title as AB Unlimited. That primarily sell deep sea and coastal, meaning up and down the coast, west coast, east coast, and deep sea is out deep sea across to uh, other continents. What led me to the flat earth was actually uh, my sister. We've always been into the conspiracies and the 9-11 and Sandy Hook and all that stuff. And uh, one day she said, hey, you want to see a conspiracy? You should look into the flat earth. And I, I looked at her and laughed because I had seen the videos come up in the feed and they showed that disc thing in the space and I laughed at it, and <laughs> whatever. And she showed it to me and I laughed at her. And I went and pulled out my phone and I looked up a video. You can look it up. It's called Dragon Link FPV to Space. And what you'll see is basically an RC airplane that's been taken up about 80,000 feet and they release it and then the airplane comes down with power and it has the drag link system which is capable of making control and video. Anyways, and, but they had a GoPro so you see this curved globe and you know that set it for me when I saw that I was like oh wow look at that. So I brought that down to her, put it right in her face and said look at that. And I, looking back, I remember her smile on it was like, you know, okay, she wasn't going to argue with me. And she said, okay. Later on, I don't know, a couple days later, whenever, I seen it in there. And I said, all right, I had nothing to watch. I hit it on the YouTube. 
And I knew within 10 minutes of it, I, do, I forget which one it was. I think it was probably uh, one of the documentaries, but it was almost like I instantly knew. And then what happened was, is a lot of the proofs that I had were before I was a flat earther, such as seeing contacts at 30 miles out with the naked eye on the horizon, which is impossible on the globe model. So much so, it was me, the third officer, and the lookout. We were standing our watch, and we were, I believe we were in the Mediterranean Sea. Look out, look and, look and watch. I say, okay, we got a contact out there. We look and we look, and we try and get it on the radar. We get it at 30 miles out. When the chief mate came up, we had told him, hey, mate, we got a contact earlier 30 miles out. He said, bull crap. I don't believe you. And we all looked at each other and shook our heads and said, yeah, yep, yeah, they got it. And we, he stormed off the bridge, ran down, came back up. He had the Bowditch, which is a green, thick green book that's everything you ever need to know about being on the ocean, sailing, navigation, everything. And he comes up and he says, the math doesn't lie. And he slams down this piece of paper and he says, our bridge height is at 100 feet versus how far? 30 miles. It should have been behind like 600 foot of curve. I remember 600 something foot. He had all the mathematical course. I didn't know, you know, okay, that's good. All right, he must know what he's talking about. But we're looking like, well, I don't know. We got it on the radar. Then the radar must not know what it's doing. You can just call me Jay. That's what my friends call me. That's what I go by. I just go by Jay. My work experience, I joined the Navy when I was 17 years old. I had a secret security clearance. There's different levels of security clearance. There's a, like a lower level, then there's a secret, which is what I had, which is like a mid-level, and then there's a top secret. I did not have a top secret clearance, so there's a lot that I don't know. But I did have a secret clearance. So it's basically the, the mid-level security clearance um, for the government that I had. And I did that job for eight years. I worked in operational intelligence specifically. The radar navigation, um, there's a limited scope of what we're able to see. Now, granted, this is 15 or 20 years ago. What I mean by that is with it being 15 or 20 years ago, the technology nowadays on the new warships, I would imagine, are just off the charts advanced compared to what we had, you know, 20 years ago in the early 2000s when I was uh, doing deployments for the Navy. We're looking at the scope of the radar. Now, this is just going off of the actual screen that we can see. Now, there's there's three different screens. There's the basic radar screen where we have this limited scope where it only goes out like 25 miles, right? Then there's this other bigger screen, and I forgot the name of it, but this like it goes onto this huge projection in the Combat Information Center, basically is where all of the information is housed. And on this huge screen, we can actually zoom out and see a significant portion of our area of responsibility. I can't say the exact number. Again, a lot of this is classified. Basically, when we zoom out onto this large projectile screen, it goes in and out, right? So the reason why we're able to zoom in and then pull back out is just for accuracy. So if we're looking at something that could just be like a buoy in the water, right? You know, just one of the little tiny buoys that track that the ships can use as kind of placements to track where they're going, that can be mistaken for an actual like small watercraft. So we have to be able to differentiate between that and some of the ships that we're looking for because some of the deployments we're on, we're out there looking for drug ships, we're looking for other types of ships submarines basically just to keep a track of everything that's basically what the navy and coast guard do they want to make sure that they know what's going on in the seas and that's kind of the way the united states navy run operates they're basically dictating what happens in, in international waters I will be providing my in-depth experience of U.S. Navy submarines and how they prove we do not live on a globe Earth. However, due to the nature of my job and the security clearance that I hold, I wish to remain anonymous.
I have worked for the U.S. Department of the Navy as a submarine quality assurance specialist the last five years. My job is to ensure that each submarine is built properly, safely, and to the engineered plan. I have an intimate knowledge of every aspect of each submarine being built in the shipyard I work in. Now that you've heard a little bit of my background, let me explain how I arrived at the crazy notion that the Earth is visibly and observably flat. I have always questioned the reality around me since I was little. I never followed anything mainstream and I was never interested in what the news had to say. As I got older, I started looking into more and more things out of my own curiosity. 9-11, soul shootings. I eventually started researching the moon landing because it just never sat well with me. And it didn't take long for me to completely unravel that for the hoax that it is. After that, I was starting to realize that we had been lied to on so many levels. What else could there possibly be? Then I saw a video about the flat earth pop up on my YouTube recommendations. At first, even with my wicked mind, I thought this is absolutely ridiculous. I decided that I'd look into it simply to disprove it and move on. It should be easy, right? That was over six years ago, and I still can't disprove the flat earth. In fact, the more I research it, the more it reveals. This leads me into my submarine experience. Looking back on everything I had accomplished while on active duty with eyes to see, I was has only served to solidify my stance that we live on a flat and motionless plane. The theory of more land being hidden on Earth as one of the possible motives to hide the fact that the Earth is not a spinning water ball corkscrewing through space is something that many flat earthers have postulated over the years. And I just couldn't shake the concept from my mind, where, just like Rear Admiral Richard Byrd suggested during his Antarctic expedition, Operation Hijump, that there is undiscovered land on Earth, and that possibility spawned an idea to write the elusive curve, a modern-day quest to discover another world. The Elusive Curve is a fictional novel credited to convey a very non-fictional message that the Earth is a flat, motionless, level plane devoid of any curvature. When Max Carter discovers irrefutable proof of the true shape of the Earth, the course of his life drastically changes and he becomes a man obsessed, convinced that there is more land being hidden beyond Antarctica and that he is going to reach it. The elusive curve debunks typical globe earth claims including ships disappearing over the horizon due to the curve of the Earth, the Foucault's pendulum, and the Coriolis effect, whilst presenting flat earth proofs like visual perspective, level water over vast distances, and long distance photography, all within the context of Max's varied and colourful relationship. Also, there have been semi classified naval communications like when ships are communicating ship to ship on the ocean, U.S. Navy. Semi classified laser communication, NAVCOM devices, also the data as well. So, if they're communicating on ship 70 miles, 100 miles or more, instead of 100 miles, a mile curvature. So, it wouldn't work because lasers operate line of sight, operate in a straight line. There's no curvature to the laser. So the bottom line here is 
the naval NAVCOM classified, semi-classified that they use to communicate ship to ship. That operates on a laser, and if there was curvature, anything over, like I said, 100 miles is flat down to 280 feet of curvature, and the ship's diameter is nowhere near that, which, which you know. So there's another example of the naval NAVCOM communication device. Also, there's a woman, a female KLH pilot, KLH uh, Doug Commercial Airlines. She got fired from her job a while back for questioning this issue. Now, they didn't throw her out of the company, but they gave her like a half job, so this way they were out of quiet. She's a very safe and rational woman. If they ask her you know, what happened, it's going to raise serious questions. So we got the KLH pilot, we got the Laser NAVCOM, U.S. Navy. Uh, we've got my personal experience flying from Long Island to Nantucket, at least 5,200 feet of temperature, added to the 4,000 altitude average while heading easterly. So there's something very wrong that has never felt more. Could the Earth actually be flat? I began to see opinions and arguments that seemed logical, but I heard several arguments, which I now know were most likely disinformation, easily disprovable in the aviation world. But there were some that stuck with me. And so myself being the way I am, I ran quickly, metaphorically, to my old textbook. And I opened my old textbooks, found them, unpacked them, cracked them all open, and even downloaded new, brand new copies in PDF form offline of all these books to make sure that nothing had been changed. I thought for certain that I knew exactly what compensation pilots are trained while flying to compensate for the spin or the rotation of the Earth, for instance. As far as falling around a globe, that assumed I assumed in my mind would be an aircraft's angle of attack. But upon more study, I found that not to be true. The angle of attack being the angle between the aircraft's flight path and the relative wind, which is something that pilots are very familiar with. And it's the idea that an aircraft has to be slightly pitched up essentially to stay airborne, or a surface of that aircraft has to be pitched slightly to create a difference in air pressure to hold the aircraft aloft. And that is assumed, or was assumed at, my, at that time by myself and other pilots, to be the compensation one would make for falling around a globe while flying, period. But upon further research, I found that this was not the case, and it was not even mentioned anywhere. This compensation was not mentioned anywhere I could find in any resource that I had gone to flight school with. And they were extensive. There were many, many books, especially as one progressed towards the commercial flying side, especially elective courses, especially if you're going to university as I was studying aerospace, then you would assume, and I had assumed, that this was calculated for. Again, as far as ADIs, in every aircraft, it references the level horizon or references sea level always. There is no way that you can convince somebody of sound mind that if you take off from New York and immediately flip upside down, now your housing or your ADI is referencing upside down to you because you're upside down. It's right side up. It cannot deviate off level. It doesn't matter how much fuel you got in your tanks. It doesn't matter if you're a helicopter or an aerostat or a fighter jet. That gauge will always reference level. It has to. Because otherwise it would be a pull reference. And if you could manipulate it, why would you even have it in the airplane or your aircraft? But if you go and take off two miles away, do a barrel roll, you're now flying upside down. At what point does that gauge show you back right side up? A half a hemisphere away? Is that, what, is that what we're led to believe? Is that what we're supposed to believe? At what point does it, does it right itself if you never flipped back over and continue flying level? You, know, you see what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's ridiculous. It's ludicrous to think that that thing compensates for curvature in straight and level flight. The big one that is oftentimes quoted is compensation for Coriolis effect while flying. And this is something I'd even taught my students about, and it's always assumed to be correct. We just assume. We're given the narrative from a young age, and we 
everything is built upon that assumption, upon the theory. And so I thought I had the, the silver bullet. Ah, Coriolis effect. We always calculate for that. Well, as I began to look through the books and to look into the calculations given for Coriolis effect, the narrative began to fall apart even further. I began to see things I didn't notice when I was in school, such as Coriolis effect is actually never calculated for, but is assumed to be a part of wind correction angle. Wind correction angle is one of the many calculations pilots of all kinds make while flying to correct against winds in whatever volume or section of air they're flying through, which it could be from any direction and you're flying through it, so you have to compensate a certain angle into that wind to hold a straight line. Interesting side note, I worked on aerostats for several years, and I always ask people who try to bring up gravity, well, how come my 4,000 pound, 74,000 000- cubic foot aerostat isn't getting pushed towards ground. It weighs more than you do, which you believe gravity is pushing you down, right? Because these are some dense ass people. But how come the aerostat's not getting driven into the ground? It weighs more. It's definitely larger than a, you know, the size of a house. It's more than most size of most houses. You know, so why isn't it getting driven to the ground? Well, that's because it's displacing less weight than the atmosphere or the medium that it's in. And I try explaining that. I don't know how many times you've probably posted something on this. I don't know how many times we're going to have to post something on this. But every time that little kid lets go of that helium balloon, it starts crying. Radar is simply another form of radio transmission. Radio in, includes anything within the, the range of the electromagnetic spectrum. Electromagnetic spectrum, also known as light. Radio is the transmission of light, whether it's visible light or radio waves, which are not visible. When it comes to radio transmissions, there must be a transmitter and a receiver. There can be a reflector or a transmittal unit along the way. However, in the end, there's got to be at least transmitter and a receiver. And in the case of radar, radar transmits a signal and it bounces off a reflector. And then it comes back to the receiving station. Or it can go to other stations if they're set up in the network properly. Long story short, radar emits a signal, it bounces off something, and then it, and then it returns to a receiving unit. And the receiving unit maps that reflection accordingly. If there is no reflector, then there's no return signal. And then the object does not show up on the radar, for example, it's the, off the screen. Notice, there's no curving around anything. It goes out in a straight line. Radio signals always travel in a straight line. So the transmitter sends this, the signal out to the, the target, bounces off, and it comes back in a straight line. Radar cannot travel over the curve, and hence, radar is dependent on line of sight, direct, direct beam from the transmission to the target. It reflects, and it comes straight back. There is no curving around anything. Thus is radar. While I was looking into uh, curvature math and looking into stuff like this, I came across an interesting word problem, which, ironically enough, absolutely nullifies the entire Ball Earth thesis. And it does so using their math. Check this out. All right. This is a website called mathcentral.eurigena.ca. I'm not sure if I pronounced that right, but whatever. Anyway, uh, you see the URL here. So they're talking about uh, how can I find the curvature per mile of the Earth's surface? And they give an answer right here. And you know they say after you do all the, the long-form math, it ends up being 7.98 inches, or like we said, everybody's just kind of rounding it up to 8 inches per mile. All right, but then it says, look at our response to Shirley to see what happens after the first mile. So you click on this. And there's an interesting question posed here at the top. There are two six-foot men. What would the distance be between them before one could not be seen because of the curvature of the Earth? And this is apparently uh, this person, Shirley, had a grandson who was stationed in Baghdad, Iraq, who was asking the question. And he goes to explain, you know, it's eight inches per mile, blah, blah, blah. But it's not, it, it you know, six feet is 72 inches. So... 
uh, 8 times 9 would be 72. So you, you might be thinking, well, it's 9 miles. The, the dude would have to be 9 miles away for a 6-foot person to be obscured at eight, 8 inches per mile. Well, no, it's not a slant. It's a curve. It's a ball. So you can't just, you know, multiply 8 times the miles. And when they go through all the Pythagorean theorem and blah, 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 you end up with 3 miles as your answer. Okay. So at 3 miles now, and we'll go back to our chart here, uh, assuming your eye level is at the ground, three miles, six foot is obscured. Now, this is what's interesting. And I'll create a little animation here for you to be able to visualize what uh, what I'm thinking here. I'll, and I'll let you think this through with me. Okay, let's just imagine our world as a beach ball. All right, the lines of the ball clearly point out what so many in the ball earth camp are blatantly ignoring. A ball, by its very nature, demands that its surface immediately begins to curve downward and away from any point on it. So if we imagine Poser James here, I'm using a software called Poser, uh, let's call him PJ for short, if we imagine him standing on the beach ball, the problem becomes immediately apparent. Okay, he's standing on a ball. Immediately the ball is curving downward and away from his feet in all directions. That's what a ball does. And it doesn't matter how big the person is, nor does it matter how big the ball is. But let's go ahead and shrink PJ and enlarge the ball for the sake of example here. Now, notice the lines are still curving downward and away in all directions, even though he's getting smaller and the ball is getting bigger. This never changes with scale. Okay, now let's zoom in to tiny PJ on the massive ball here and consider the curvature word problem that was brought up by this individual serving in Iraq. If PJ was six feet tall and he had a clone, who's also six feet tall, right, who walked one mile away from him, the ground his clone would be standing on would be eight inches lower than the ground that he was standing on, right? Again, the curvature math is eight inches per mile squared. So the first mile, one times one is one times eight is eight inches. So the ground from point A to point B Point B is going to be 8 inches below point A. All right, you with me so far? Now, if the clone had a clone who walked another mile away, that clone's ground would be 32 inches below PJ's ground. Why? Because it's 8 inches per mile squared. 2 miles, okay, 2 times 2 is 4 times 8 is 32. So the ground that clone number 2 is standing on is 32, almost 3 feet below the ground that PJ is standing on. And if we had yet another clone who was to walk one more mile, his ground would be 72 inches or 6 feet below PJ's. Thus, the top of clone number 3's head would be even with the bottom of PJ's feet. I know, for some of you, the gerbil just jumped off the wheel. So let's look at it again. This time, we'll check it out from a different angle. Again, PJ's clone walks one mile away. The top of his head would be 8 inches lower than PJ's. Another clone walks an additional mile, and the top of his head is then 32 inches below PJ's. The third clone walks one more mile, and at just three miles away from PJ, the ground clone number three is standing on is six feet below PJ's. Thus, the top of clone number three's head is going to be even with the bottom of PJ's feet. Now, I'm not trying to see whether or not the person can see the other person. What I'm trying to show you is the issue of the ground level. The ground level is the issue that I'm focused on with this example. Because if clone number three's ground is 72 inches below the ground that PJ is standing on, it's going to be physically impossible for PJ to look straight ahead or to the left or the right or behind him and ever expect to see the horizon at his eye level. It can not be done. I'm going to say it again. If you're just looking straight ahead, there is no way the horizon could ever be at your eye level. When the ground you're standing on is immediately beginning to recede away from you in every direction, you're, you're standing on a point on a ball, supposedly, 
the ground you're standing on immediately begins to recede away in every direction, eight inches per mile squared. Now, I understand we're not on a perfect beach ball, but you actually compound the problem if you start using the argument, well, there are, you know, peaks and valleys and hills and mountains and plateaus and canyons and blah, blah, blah. All you're doing is pushing the problem further out. And eventually you, the ball earther who uses this argument, are the one who's in danger of falling off the edge of something because... You can extend that out only so far, and then you're going to have to correct the terrain back to that 8 inches per mile squared so that you can have your 25,000 miles circumference ball. Or pair if you choose to um, go by Neil deGrasse Tyson. But for this math to be true, and it has to be in order to maintain a 25,000 miles circumference, no person could ever look straight ahead and expect to see the horizon at his eye level. But still, this is what we have to put up with. The most important thing to understand is that the horizon is flat. That's right. From our vantage point, even from a high mountain or an airplane, the horizon is flat. Flat earthers, and also many globalists, for lack of a better term, seem to think that the horizon should look curved to us. That's flat wrong. And I think this is the single biggest reason there even is a flat earth community. The biggest source of confusion. You are expecting to see a curve where there is none to be seen. You are looking for the wrong thing. To picture what I mean, look at this orange. If I take a thin slice of it, I get a round disc. The edges of it, where the knife cut through, is a flat circle. That is what you see when you look at the horizon, the edges of a circle. The edges don't curve side to side, they run straight across our view. And since we are always in the center of the circle, they don't curve down. My first question is, why is this dude wearing fingernail polish? But, you know, I guess everybody's entitled to their thing. Um, but my other observation was, after he said, if I take an orange and slice it off, um, sorry, you can't do that. <laughs> If if your orange is representing the Earth, you've got to leave its spherical nature intact. You can't slice off the top of the sphere that you're using as your example and then say, that's why everything's flat, because I just sliced off the curve. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Anyway, let's go back to uh, Captain Fingernail Polish and uh, see what other piece of amazing logic he has for us. When you can see the horizon in all directions, it is the same distance away in all directions. So when you spin around, it looks exactly like a straight line and comes back around to join itself. Think about that. If it were curved down, it would not come back around and join itself at the same level. Exactly. <laughs> if it were curved, it would be dropping off 8 inches per mile squared from every point upon which you are standing. That is inescapable ball-earth math. <laughs> wow. Okay, to be fair, I do understand what Captain Fingernail Polish is uh, saying here. This is a typical argument that I've heard lots of times, actually. Ball earthers will claim that, just like the blue circle at the top of the beach ball here, that's the visible horizon. So from whatever point you're standing on, and you're looking out toward the horizon, in 360 degrees, that line is going to be the same. It's, it's always going to be right there. But as I'm showing you, that only works if you're looking down. I don't care how big the ball is. I don't care how big you are. I don't care how small you are compared to the ball. If you're standing on the ball, the point at which you are standing, from that point outward, is receding downward at an exponential rate. Downward. Which means you can never look out to this mystical circle out in front of you at eye level. It cannot be. It can't happen. So this whole idea right here, while in principle it, it sounds good, looks good, but it's a myth. It does not exist in the observable, testable, and repeatable example of reality. According to Pythagorean math, the 25,000 mile circumference ball Eratosthenes invented does not allow for us to ever, ever be able to see the supposed edge of a horizon that presents itself at eye level. Yet whether we're on the ground or flying up to 37,000 feet in an airplane or sending up a weather balloon to over 100,000 feet, there's that totally flat horizon straight ahead at our eye level. Always. 
That's simply not possible if it's receding downward and away from us at a rate of 8 inches per mile squared, which is what it must do. But once again, in reality, we don't see this. Therefore, this whole idea that's depicted here and that was depicted with the slicing of the orange, that that whole idea is a myth. It doesn't exist in reality unless you're looking downward, which I don't know about you, but I don't go around in my everyday life looking at the ground. I stand straight up and I look straight out and there's the horizon at my eye level. Not possible with Pythagorean math on Eratosthenes' ball. And speaking of myths, people who think ships are disappearing over the curve in less than 10 miles distance, it's got to work both ways. I mean, if we're on a ball, then when the ship is going away from you on the, let's say, the z-axis, going you know, from you to a point away from you, and it's rolling over the ball in less than 10 miles, then you should have the exact same effect looking left to right on the x-axis. You should be seeing ships rolling up to the top of the ball and rolling down on the lateral x-axis. You know, I mean, if it's a ball, it's got to be they got to be rolling both ways, away from you and side to side. We never see that though. You can go to the beach and do a panoramic shot and put a parallel line over it, and from end to end, and this is a lot more than just five miles. There's no perceived curvature here, none, flat as a pancake. In fact, these are some pictures I took. Uh, on the beach at Malibu, California. And I, I went from there way up into the mountains above Pepperdine University and looked out. And I mean, easily, there's got to be probably close to 100 miles left to right. The, the distance on the horizon there, it's got to be, you know, quite a bit there. Put a parallel line over it, flat. So you can't have it both ways. You can't say ships are rolling over the ball on the Z axis without having the same exact perception on the X axis. I was thinking about that while we were on Lake Michigan. We were on the east coast of the lake looking toward the west. And so if you're standing on the east coast looking toward the west and you claim that ships are disappearing in three, four, five, you know, ten miles, whatever distance, then people who are standing on the southern coast line would make the same claim. If they're on the south looking toward the north, they would say the same thing. Well, I see ships disappearing in 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 miles away. So if the person standing on the south coast looking north is claiming that ships are disappearing, and the person standing on the east coast looking west is saying the same thing, then both people have to observe the alleged curvature that the other person is claiming their ships are going over. Therefore, like I said... This whole idea of the eye-level horizon being equal, uh, as depicted here, or as depicted when you slice off a piece of an orange, is a myth. All right, let's continue. There's a handy website that will calculate the distance to the horizon for any viewing height, and it also tells you how much of an object will be hidden behind the horizon if it's past the horizon. The site is metabunk.org slash curve. So I went there, and this is the calculator that's there, and you can run all the same calculations that we, I showed you in the other websites. You know, it works very much the same way. Uh, but this is what's interesting to me. Let's look at this graphic right here on the bottom. See, they always got this thing in the middle between the observer and the target, and it's called the bulge. And they'll have you believe that everything you're looking at is on the other side of a big hump. A big bulge. You're always going to have to walk uphill first and then walk downhill to get to wherever you're going. In all of these examples, it's always this way. Okay, they got this this target, you know, over here and the observer over here and this big bulge in the middle. And that's what all these ballers would have you believe is that everything you're looking at is on the other side of a big bulge. You're going to have to walk or drive or swim or take a boat or fly over to get to. And somebody else has done videos on how big that bulge would be if you're flying from like uh, Los Angeles to Hawaii. I mean, it gets quite absurd when you start putting it in the, into these terms. But let me just simplify all of this for you and bring PJ back into the picture. Now, he's standing on top of the ball, right? But I'm going to slide him over 
to uh, the observation point here. Now I'm keeping them perpendicular to the ground. Now, do you see the problem? The only way he could be looking toward the top of the bulge is if he's tilting his head down. He'd have to be looking down. He couldn't be standing straight up looking straight out. The only way he's going to see the curve is if he's looking down. Let's keep PJ looking straight ahead, and I'm going to slide him down so that his eyeball essentially ends up on the ground, looking straight out, and you're going to see the problem here. Look, at ground level, if, he's, if, he's, if his eyeball is on the ground and he's looking straight out, the ground is beginning to immediately curve downward. There's no bulge. There's no bulge. Balls, it don't work that way. If you're standing perpendicular on top of at any point on the ball, but yet every single curvature chart you're going to find is going to show this same kind of nonsense, where they either have the, the observer or the target at ridiculous angles, or they're forcing the observer to look downward, such as in this example. But there's also plenty of others that depict essentially the same thing. In fact, if you go back to the Channel 57 ABC News Report Skyline Skepticism, the Lake Michigan Mirage, you remember the weatherman said, now we have a lot of web extras with this story. Log on to abc57.com after this newscast. You can see the time lapse, a short lecture by Dr. Rennie, and how you can calculate how far you can see to the horizon based on your location. Reporting live, I'm Chief Meteorologist Tom Coombs. So let's check that out. Here on the website, scroll down, scroll down, and he's got this link right here. How far away is the horizon? If you click on that, it takes you to this page right here. Uh, from Discover Magazine, I guess. How far away is the horizon from bad astronomy? That's properly labeled, I think. <laughs> bad astronomy. Uh, bad. Uh, it could also be bad geometry. So they've got this picture right here. You know, to help you figure out the Earth's curvature, you got uh, your little man here. In this case, standing perpendicular to the ground, but he's looking down. He's not looking straight out. He's looking down. They always depict it that way. In fact, if we go to this other one here, Earth Curve Calculator, a lot of people like to use this one. This is the way it looks today. But I'm going to tell you that's not the way it has always looked. They've got the H0 or, or the observer here and the target uh, perpendicular with the ground. But this is a recent change to the website. This is the way they used to depict it. They used to have H0 and H1 straight up and down instead of perpendicular with the green line representing the globe. Here's a meme I created back on January 16th and I posted it on Facebook. You see the problem here? Look at this Look at this graphic. Look at the way they have H0 and H1. See the angles? See the problem? That would mean that the person on H1 and the target are leaning inward, which means they're not standing perpendicular to the ground. They're leaning inward. I posted this meme on Facebook, and uh, as I was making this video and getting ready to use this example right here, guess what? Okay, I posted this January 16th, and here it is February 2nd, and I go to this website and it's changed. So just to prove that they did this, you know, somebody must have showed them the meme or saw something that you know either myself or somebody else was pointing out to 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 mock this graphic. So they changed it. Uh, and here's the proof. You go back to the Wayback Machine, go back to uh, October of last year, and what do you know? <laughs> There's the original one that was just you know a few months ago that they changed because they know that we're on to their game here. They know that what they're putting out is crap, but at least they're consistent. And they're doing the same thing everybody else is doing. So let's go back to this other one from Metabunk. Now, I'm going to enlarge this graphic and orient it so that PJ is standing straight up and down again and lower him so that he's within the observer square. Now, this is what they're saying. This is the observer looking toward the horizon. But unlike their example here where they're forcing the observer to look downward toward the horizon, my observer is in their little square looking straight out. And from the feet of my observer, the ground is curving downward just like it would do in real life if we're standing on a ball. For those of you who are interested in doing so, here's a simple test, and it doesn't require that you be a Freemason, a Luciferian, a Nazi, an occultist, or an atheist. You don't even need to have a college education or a lot of money. 
what you need to do is get a long pole that would uh, facilitate putting something uh, up to your eye level. In this case, I've got like a 4x4 with a plank of wood on top of it. Make sure the uh, vertical post is vertically level and make sure the horizontal plate on top of it is also level. And then go get some paper towels. Use the paper towel tube. You can even keep the paper towels on it if you want to. But if you have just an empty uh, paper towel tube, uh, you can set on, you know, tape to the top of it and then stand behind it such that your eyeball is looking right through it. And then just look straight ahead through this forced experiment right here that keeps you keeps everything looking straight. And I would suggest you do this at a beach somewhere so you don't have to deal with the topography of the land. You, you know, you're, you're going to know that there aren't any peaks and valleys, mountains and and canyons or whatever in on the ocean. You're going to have a straight flat horizon. And if you do this, you're going to see the horizon is going to be right there. It's going to be right as you're looking through that tiny little field of view, through that paper towel tube, you're going to see the horizon is going to be at eye level. And yet we've just shown you that that is physically impossible. That cannot happen. The ground has to be dropping away from you, receding downward in every direction from the point at which you're standing. That's the way it works on a ball. That's the way the ball earth math works. According to Pythagoras and according to the spherical model invented by Eratosthenes who calculated our circumference to within about 5% of its currently accepted circumference of 25,000 miles by looking at the sun in a well and the shadow of a phallic symbol. So as you can see, this produces an extremely interesting problem for the ballers. And frankly, it means that Pythagoras and Eratosthenes just handed a trump card to the flat earthers. And pardon the pun, but there's simply no way around this problem. Indeed, if the squares of a chessboard or one mile across, all it takes is three moves for any flat earther to quickly put a ball earther into checkmate. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video presentation. If you did, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, like the video, and share it on your favorite social media sites. There's a lot more to come, so stay tuned and we'll see you back next time.